on the beginning of his third missionary journey. You'll remember, please, that he left Aquila and Priscilla at Ephesus as he ended his second missionary journey and went back to Jerusalem and then to Antioch. And a fellow from Alexandria by the name of Apollos came. Apparently he was a great orator, great preacher, well-studied, well-versed in the Word of God that he had. They were able to take him and expound to him the way of the Lord more plainly. And instead of getting his fur up on the nap of his neck and having the attitude, you can't tell me anything, he was teachable. And I talked about that teachable spirit that Apollos had, and I would hope that each one of us would want that same kind of spirit. I started to say covet that spirit, and then I thought somebody might say, Oh, Brother Burkholder, it's wrong to covet. <clears throat> okay, covet earnestly the best gifts. Right? So, uh, I think a teachable spirit is something that we should want for ourselves. I want that for myself and I want it for you folks likewise. Also, in regards to Apollos, you remember that I said I believed he was mightily used of the Lord. There at the end of chapter 18 and beginning of chapter 19, because he had real humility. Now, there's a difference between faults put on humility and true humility. The Pharisees had the faults put on humility, but the Lord giveth the true humility. Micah 6 8, for instance, tells us, He hath showed thee, O man, what is right. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? First Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 5 we find the need to grow in humility. Philippians excuse me chapter number 2 verses 5 and following we have the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who became flesh definite humility for our sakes. And then James chapter 4 and verse 10 tells us, talks to us about humbling ourselves in the sight of God and He shall lift you up. Sometimes we want to make sure that we get the notoriety that is due unto us. Uh, let me save you some trouble and let me give you a, a little hint. Don't seek the notoriety that is due you. You might just get it. And you may not like it so much after you get it. I mean, if God were the one handing out the various things, it would be a different story. And so I want to tell you, you just go ahead and be what you can be for Jesus Christ. Don't worry about whether people notice it or not. Worry about whether the Lord notices it. If people don't notice, well, that's okay. Hopefully you're not doing it just for people. I started to say for people. I'm going to add just for people because hopefully we are wanting to do things in the name of Christ for others around us. Are we not? I mean, come on, that's Christianity 101. But hopefully our main goal is to be doing it for the Lord and not expecting His applause in return. Just to be doing it for the Lord should be enough for us. Oh, may God help us to be such as that. And I think, personally, that Apollos was greatly used of the Lord because of the humility that he had. And then, as we go into chapter number 19, we have these words. Apollos is at the first. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, remember Apollos had gone on over to Corinth at the end of chapter number 18, with the letters of commendation from the brothers that were there at Ephesus. Apollos went on across the sea over to Corinth, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. 
You remember I used the phrase over and over about Paul took the sea route at the end of his second missionary journey back to Jerusalem, but he took the land route on the coastline back to Ephesus at the beginning of his third missionary journey. And so hence the Bible puts it this way, Paul having passed the upper coast came to Ephesus, which is in uh, what's called modern-day Turkey. And there the Bible says, finding certain disciples. But then it goes on to tell us some things that he found out. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Verse number 7 closes out this section then, and all the men were about twelve. There weren't a great number of them, but apparently they were very sincere in following the Lord. And when they likewise heard of the more perfect way that was in Christ Jesus, they took it to heart and followed it. Just because they had gotten to a certain point in their relationship with God did not keep them from going further with the Lord. They wanted to press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If I may borrow from Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 14. And so these fellows here were discovered by Paul in the town of Ephesus when he came back. As verse number 1 says, finding certain disciples. But then we have three things in particular brought to our attention, each of which needs, well, really several lessons, but I'm going to try to condense them to one lesson each. We have three things brought to our attention. One is, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And so we have the subject of the Holy Spirit of God. And then next, we have the subject of baptism. You'll notice in verse number 3, He said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so we have the Holy Ghost, which is definitely a subject, which I guarantee you one lesson isn't going to even... Uh, scratch the surface, but hopefully we can glean some things from it. And then we also have the second thing brought especially to our attention here, and that is baptism. And I would like to say that I believe that we have involved here water baptism. Let me go on to the third thing and then I'll come back to this. Verse number 6 gives us the third important thing that I think we need to touch on and talk a great deal about. And that is, when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And that third thing that I wish to call to our attention, that I think is brought here to our attention very specifically, is what we would call in theological terms glossolalia or speaking in tongues, if you prefer. And that, of course, is quite a subject that people uh, in varying degrees are interested in. 
It is certainly something for us to look at, and I wish to do that. But tonight, mainly, I want to confine my words, excuse me again, please, and my remarks to baptism. Now, first of all, I wish to say that I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For by one Spirit are ye all baptized into one body. And I do believe that that takes place when a person comes to Jesus Christ as their Savior. I believe they receive the Holy Spirit of God and they are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. That is a subject that we'll take up a little more thoroughly a little later on. But I want to say that this baptism of what they're speaking of here, I believe, is water baptism. And I might like to add that I believe, as the Bible says, these folks had been baptized, what shall I say, under the authority, under the auspices, under the mindset, of John's baptism. And do you remember when I said that I didn't want to upset anybody, but I did not believe John's baptism was Christian baptism? I said it. I just said it again, and I'll keep on saying it. Now here we have a case where some folks who had been baptized under John's baptism, I mean, bear me witness, they got baptized again in the name of the Lord Jesus. Or if I may so put it this way, under the auspices or under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, which of course was a different thing altogether. John's baptism looked forward to Christ. Christian baptism looks backward at the work of Jesus Christ our Savior. And so we have here then these people being baptized and the Bible says in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I believe that. Somebody is going to say, well, Brother Burke Holder, when you baptize somebody you generally say, I now baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, why don't you just use the name of the Lord Jesus? Well, because if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, please, I want to read what Jesus had to say. Now this is Jesus obviously initiating and giving authority in these areas. In verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 28, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then he goes on to say, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so when I baptize someone, I say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Because that's what Jesus said to do. Now, for argument's sake, I'll ask the question in this way. Am I baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus when I say that? Of course I am. But if I use only the name of the Lord Jesus, I feel like I'm leaving out the Father and the Holy Spirit. And God is a trinity. That's shown all the way through the Bible. But it's specifically and very identifiably so stated in Matthew chapter number 28 in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And so when I use that formula in baptism, I am using the name of the Son. 
I am just likewise using the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit of God, which I believe is the correct way of doing it. Now, of course, those fellows back in Acts chapter number 19 had been baptized under John's baptism. I do not know what verbal formula he may have used, but it was something other than what Paul considered correct, right? I'm safe in saying that. There's no doubt about it. And when they heard what Paul had to say, completing the work of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, John's baptism looked forward to it. But hey, by the time Paul talked to these fellows, Jesus had already died on Calvary for their sins, had already been buried, and had already risen again the third day for their justification. Their justification, let me put it this way, our justification. And so, they were baptized therefore under the authority, under the auspices, in the realm of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, mode, I believe, was immersion. Now, for whatever it's worth, I think the mode for Christian baptism is immersion too. In case you didn't notice that, that's why we have them baptismal tank up here. You guys got it easy. My dad used to baptize in the Arkansas River. To our Kansas friends, that's the Arkansas River. Okay, I learned that when I was in Kansas preaching. But, uh, my dad used to baptize in Colorado in the Arkansas River when ice chunks were floating down it. That's the way they did things back in those days. You guys got it easy. You're really suffering for the Lord. You know, heated baptistry uh, pools inside the church. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm thankful for it. <laughs> uh, um, talk about each generation getting softer. I don't know whether that's true or not of all of them, but it's true of Dad and myself anyway. I've gotten softer. I don't want to baptize in the Arkansas River with ice chunks floating down. The fact of the business is the way I've seen the Arkansas flowing up there in Colorado, I don't want to baptize in it at all. It flows so fast in parts of it, it'll suck the feet right out from under you and down you go. Whee! Is the way it is. Boy, that would make quite a baptism service, wouldn't it? But, um, I, I don't want to do it. In other words, I appreciate all the modern conveniences we have. Now somebody I know is going to say, well, Brother Burkholder, the way they did it in the Bible was to go out to the natural rivers and to the lakes. Mind you now, there in John chapter number 3, uh, John was baptizing in and on where there was much water. Mode of baptism, immersion, not sprinkling, not pouring. There was much water. Baptism, baptizo, Greek, put in. Got two two meanings, by the way, in case you're interested, a primary meaning and a secondary meaning. The primary meaning is to put in without taking out. <laughs> now go ahead and laugh, but that's its primary meaning when the Holy Spirit of God puts us into the body of Christ. Amen. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Man, when you get saved, you're put into the body of Christ. You're not only saved, you're safe Amen. in Christ. It's not your holding on to Him that matters. It's His holding on to you that keeps you from floating down the river. In the secondary meaning, it means to put in and take out. That's where it is in the water baptism in the Bible. And I know that most of you are interested in my following that secondary meaning uh, when I uh, baptize uh, people up here. Well, we have the formula for Christian baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because you see, if you'll stop to think about it, that engulfs the whole of the gospel. And I could go on and on uh, in just that. But I say the whole of the gospel, the Father. No man comes to Jesus Christ except the Father draw him. Amen. Right? Yes. 
And yet, let's include the Holy Spirit of God in there too. In order to come to Christ, the Holy Spirit of God has got to convict or convince of the truth in Jesus Christ down inside the heart. Amen. When He has come, He will convict the world or convince us or reprove as it is in our language, which is the correct word, by the way. But it's got the idea of convict and convincing behind it there. And we have then in the formula, in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Lord died on the cross for our sins. The Father waits for us to come unto Him. you got to come by Christ, though, because He's the way, the truth, and the life and no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. And the only way you're going to come to saving faith is by the Holy Spirit of God enlightening. If I could use that word, I almost hate to use it because it's almost a New Age word in my uh, thought process anyway. And yet it is true, isn't it, folks? The Holy Spirit of God has to teach us. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who has to open up our thick skulls and explain it to us. And let me go a little bit further than this on this. A lot of times you don't get it all. Right? A lot of times I don't get it all. But it's just as real. Because the Holy Spirit of God convinces and convicts us of the truth. So we have the formula in Christian baptism. And I believe that we have the mode of Christian baptism being immersion. By the way, when it comes to the mode of Christian baptism, you'll remember, please, that in Acts chapter number 8, where Philip the Evangelist, you guys remember Philip the Evangelist and the Ethiopian eunuch? And Philip witnessed to him out of none other than Isaiah chapter 53, which by the way happens to be higher ground one chapter for the month of January. Philip witnessed to him of salvation out of Isaiah chapter 53. Never forget that. I'm convinced we are not getting all there is in that chapter. Our brains have retrogressed instead of progressed in many cases, I'm afraid. But here we have Philip witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch. And pretty soon the eunuch says, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Do you remember that? Amen. And Philip said, There is something hindering you. Now, I know that's not said in the text. I know I'm... Uh, giving commentary there. I'm not adding to it. I'm giving commentary the, on the text there. Uh, Philip was saying, well, there is, there is something. You can't really have Christian baptism until you get saved. Amen. See, <clears throat> that's, that's what he's saying. I mean, didn't Philip say, if thou believest? But you've got to take the whole of the Bible's teaching on the belief in Jesus Christ as our Savior. You've got to believe He died on the cross for your sins. You've got to believe He rose again the third day for your sins. You've got to believe He's in heaven today. You've got to believe that He'll save you if you'll invite Him into your heart to save you. If thou believest, Philip said, well, there is one thing. You've you got to really be saved. And I think by that time, for whatever it's worth, if you'll read there in Acts chapter number 8 when you get time, because it's fastly running out tonight. But when you get time, read in Acts chapter number 8, and you'll find the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, personally, I think, I believe that when um, the eunuch asked Philip, or, or I guess I should say stated to Philip, see here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? I think the eunuch personally had already made his decision for Christ. Amen. I, I think by an act of his will, can I use that terminology? I mean he'd already settled it down on the inside. He'd... Uh, I think listening to Philip talk about Jesus Christ, the Ethiopian eunuch, so to speak, said, boy, that's for me. I want the Lord as my Savior. Amen. And I don't think he waited for the invitation. 
I don't think he waited uh, for New Year's or the revival meeting time to come around or anything else. I think, uh, boy, when it dawned on him, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one. Now that eunuch, he'd already been involved in the Scriptures. Well, hadn't he? Come on, he was reading Isaiah 53. <laughs> He, he was already involved, and, and man, when he heard that, boy, I think joy flooded his soul. Amen. And he thought, Lord, thou hast already come, and you have already done the work at Calvary, and I want you as my Savior. I think he was already saved. So when he said to Philip, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Uh, Philip said, well, if thou believest. Uh, and he said, Philip, I believe. I don't think he got saved then. I think he was already saved. Amen. But I do think he... <laughs> public confession. I said public confession. I know you're probably saying, uh, Brother Burkholder, don't you know that was desert country down there, uh, desert down toward Gaza, headed down toward Ethiopia, south of Egypt there and so on. Don't you know there wasn't anybody around there? No, I don't know there wasn't anybody around there. There may have been a lot of people around there. After all, water is important in that part of the world. And after all, he said, see, here is water. And so it must have not been everywhere. And there could have been a, an oasis-like situation there. There could have been people there. On the other hand, I do not know that there were people there. I just don't know. But I do know, he said, I believe. Amen. And I expect to see him in heaven one of these days. I do know that he got baptized because it says, if you'll look at it, uh, please, they went down, both of them, into the water. And I'm not even going to get my first lesson on baptism started today, uh, tonight or whatever. Uh, we'll have to come back to it. Uh, um, but here we have them both going down into the water. Right? That's what it says. They went down, both of them, into the water. And uh, I think that's indicative, again, of the uh, mode of baptism by immersion. They went, both of them, into the water. i got to tell you this, and uh, then I'll have to come back to baptism uh, later. We'll go on to our prayer request. But, um, now I'm for a person getting baptized after they get saved. Amen. If for no other reason, and i got a lot of verses to get to, but if for no other reason than Jesus said do it, I'm for doing it. Um, I'll understand it better by and by, but I'm for doing what Jesus has to say. Uh, yes, it's good for us to understand some things, but if you wait till you understand it all, you're never going to do a thing for Jesus Christ. So I'm for a person getting saved, and I'm for a person getting baptized under the auspices of uh, the Lord Jesus. That's going to get me into the church and the authority and so on and so forth. We've got a long way to go on this lesson. So don't think we're finished with it. Just yet exactly. I wanted to close though with this simple uh, illustration. I remember <laughs> uh, one time we were going to uh, get a new baptistry and uh, uh, this was back down in Houston and I thought to myself well we'll look here a little bit and see about baptistries and I saw um, one of those baptistries that uh, was uh, what I call a, a half baptistry I don't know whether you guys have seen them or not you have, Marcia, because I've showed pictures of you. Justin, I'm sure you've uh, seen. Jake, you've found them. Half baptistries, you, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're like uh, skinny baptistries. They're long, but they're skinny. One person goes in. The person to be baptized goes in, and the minister just goes behind it. And everybody out in the audience thinks he's in the water too, but he's not. 
And I saw one of those and I thought to myself, man, that would be neat. Uh, I'd get one of those and uh, <laughs> bye-bye Arkansas River for good. Um, and then I thought to myself, well, it says they went down both of them into the water. <laughs> Now, I know some of you are going to say, Brother Burkhold, aren't you nitpicking a little bit? Maybe I am. I'm not going to judge the next guy on the thing. But I'm saying for me, I have to have a baptistry like we've got up here. I've got to have both of us in the water down here. Because it says they went down both of them. And obviously in the Bible, uh, now Jesus didn't baptize, but his disciples did. And... Uh, Paul did, and John did. Of course, it was not Christian baptism, but the mode was the same. And I think that both of them were full-fledged in the water there. So for me, I have to do it that way. I feel that as much as in us as possible, we should do things the way it was done in the Bible. Shouldn't we? Uh, let me give you a word of caution in closing. Be careful a little bit. We want to do, do it as much as within us as possible and as meritorious and right like it was done in the Bible. But now, <clears throat> let me give you a couple things, cite a couple things that will help us to take a little different perspective. They didn't have nice pews in Bible days. They didn't have air conditioning in Bible days. They didn't have these kind of buildings in Bible days. I got to admit, some of those buildings are probably better built. A lot of them are still standing. They didn't have electric lights back in those days. I don't know about you, but I enjoy the air conditioning. Mm -hmm. I enjoy the pews. Uh, probably a lot of you even enjoy the sound system, even though I goofed a minute ago and got a little bit too close to the speaker. But um, I enjoy a lot of strides that we've made. We have to have balance. We do have to keep our minds on this. As much as in us as possible, let's do it in the Bible way. With, with care being taken, you know, you can go overboard. You can kind of get way out in left field or, or right field too far sometimes. You have to be careful. But I will say this, that for me, I have to have one of those baptistry tanks that both of us go down on the inside. I'm not sure I can explain it fully other than the support of the Bible. Both of them went down. But on the inside of me, you pray about stuff, folks. You'll be surprised how God can lead you. And give you a peace about something or an unsettled feeling about something. Well, I'm going to close there this evening. We still have a lot of territory to cover on baptism, let alone the Holy Ghost and uh, speaking in tongues, which I want to get to, and I think you guys will enjoy the studies on them. But we'll close there for this evening and make our prayer requests known. I've already made a couple of prayer requests known. You guys may have other requests to make known. If so, uh, please raise your hand and speak up good and solidly so I can hear and I'll get in my